Okay, thanks. Thanks very much for uh, the invitation and thanks for being here on a Saturday. So this is uh, joint work with um, Tasso Domopoulos at York University in, in Toronto. My colleague Lauren Brandt in Toronto and Jessica Light at Williams. And this paper is about kind of misallocation and, and, and selection, uh, misallocation in the agricultural sector and, and selection and productivity. We're going to use the data for China. So, I mean, the, let me just give you a rough picture of where this, this paper fits. Um, the paper is obviously about understanding the, the large income differences uh, across countries. And um, this kind of two very broad literatures that have emphasized, on the one hand, the importance of kind of the, the the allocation of factors across uh, heterogeneous production units to, to generate uh, aggregate, uh, aggregate impact. And also the, um, the literature on kind of the importance of agriculture for, for development, especially the, the, the role of agriculture for the gap between the very rich and the very poor, because agriculture turns out to be very, uh, the, the productivity levels in agriculture are much lower in the poor countries relative to rich. And that's where the poor countries allocate mo most of the labor. And so um, there's, a, there's a recent uh, literature that, that talks about uh, kind of resort misallocation being uh, pervasive in agriculture, especially uh, when you connect it to kind of a factor that is particularly important in agriculture, which is uh, land. Okay, so, so things that are related to land markets. You made that agricultural productivity lags in uh, developing countries. Uh, how about the relative difference? Like agriculture in developed yeah, so it's a, it, isn't it higher? I mean, isn't it better? No, no, it's it's it's, it's the opposite. So the, the we, we, so poor countries are unproductive uh, in both both sectors when when you break it down this way. But they are the the relative productivity in agriculture is much lower in the agricultural sector the relative to rich. Poor countries are better at primary products as opposed to complex uh, industries. I think it's, it's, I mean, you see it, uh, certain exports, but overall, the, 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 the overall gap in agriculture productivity relative to non-agriculture is, uh, is much larger in, in, uh, in, in poor countries. And so that's why um, kind of in this, in this literature, if you, if you just do an accounting of trying to understand the, the aggregate income differences and, and you kind of separate the contribution of agriculture and then those two, those two things will, will be very important. The fact that agricultural productivity levels are much lower relative to non-agriculture in poor countries relative to rich, and the fact that then uh, most of the labor is allocated in the agricultural sector. Is this across all developing countries, or is it dependent on maybe just those countries that have a lot of subsistence farmers? Well, this, uh, obviously, this is something that really uh, matters when you, when you look at the very, very poor, very rich. Uh, you know, when, when you start looking at the middle of the, the, the income distribution, then agriculture doesn't, doesn't matter too much. Um, and then when you, when you think about the very poor, uh, yes, the, the, it tends to go in hand that what you see is that there's a lot of subsistence farming. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a second. So the idea in this paper is basically that um, uh, there's going to be some land market frictions. I'm going to motivate this in the context of the, of the institutions in China. Okay, So I'll, I'll discuss that in, in, a, in a second. But think about just uh, general uh, labor, uh, labor market distortions that are going to disproportionately affect um, uh, more productive farmers. And <clears throat> this is going to uh, reduce aggregate agricultural productivity for two reasons. The one, which is standard, uh, has been emphasized a lot in the literature, which is the, the impact that those distortions have in the allocation of resources across farmers that kind of dampens uh, uh, aggregate productivity. That's a standard static misallocation effect. And then the, the, other, the other channel, the other margin, is going to be that, uh, in this paper, it's going to be that um, um, it would also affect the type of farmers that operate in agriculture. So it's going to generate some selection. And so here, selection is going to generate, it's going to act as an amplification effect of misallocation on aggregate productivity. 
And, and it's also going to affect kind of the productivity distribution of kind of the production units that we see in the sector, and therefore would affect how we measure um, misallocation in the first place. Yeah. Is there some role for capital intensity? Maybe this is not, not productive because they don't do For sure, the, well, uh, you mean in, in the real world or? Yeah. Yeah, so those. Uh, <laughs> Um, there's, there's a lot of channels through which this effect will have kind of magnifying effects through maybe, uh, you know, mechanization would be an obvious one. Um, but for example, you go to other countries where other type of infrastructure is key, like uh, irrigation, right? And so those are, those are things that require investment and um, um, the, the idea is you're not, you're not going to say, oh, the, the productivity is low because there's no infrastructure, because they are not mechanized. But you know, why is it that mechanization doesn't occur? Why, is it, why, why these irrigation systems don't occur? And so <clears throat> I, I want to think about these this kind of landmark institutions as being kind of the driver that, that uh, distort economic incentives that prevent those, those activities to occur. But, so in the model, I'm not going to have uh, these channels. But I think when you, when, you, when you think about these institutions and the effect they have, um, uh, the, the effects are, are much broader than what I'm going to talk about here. Yeah. So clarify, clarify the selection channel. Farmers, they can operate in agriculture or something else? Or is it the type of agents who become farmers? Yeah, it's go I'm going to make it that uh, precise when I, when I talk about the model. But yeah, it's going to be a standard ROI model where people have ability in the two sectors and then will optimally choose uh, where to work. Yeah, so I'll make that precise. Usually, in the small land, the literature is always taken exogenous to total share of lands allocated to agriculture. Yeah. So that might be a structural change in that, too, I suppose. That might be changing over time in developing countries. Is this the case? Or? Uh, I mean, I can see. So, why? What, what do you have in mind? So, if, for instance, if the, if the total land is, getting, is shrinking in size and more like factories are being developed. And like that, then, the, then productivity might itself be going up. Yeah, like in a growing economy, I don't think that that balance is such, such a big problem because you know if productivity grows, then you need less factors to produce kind of the the, the, the consumption of agriculture, right? So we, we know when income rises, people consume other goods, and so I think that those those forces will tend to balance out. Um, in a non-growing economy, then it may maybe become a, of a constraint. Everything is going to depend on that. Yes, uh, I'll talk about that. And in fact, it's you know that lots of applications in labor were really identifying that correlation is going to be critical, and uh, so it's going to play a role. I'll, I'll talk about that. So now, why China? Um, so China is an interesting case. This is a rapidly growing economy with a lot of sectoral reallocation. Now it's interesting and, and it's suggestive of kind of a problem, uh, an underlying problem in the agricultural sector is that um, despite all that growth, there's really no, no systematic improvement in kind of this gap or this income gap between non-agriculture and agriculture, which you typically see in, in economies that develop. Can you clarify that? What do you mean by product? You mean uh, output per worker of agriculture versus non-agriculture? Yeah, you can measure in, yes. Yeah, when you when you look at labor productivity, for example, but, you know you can you can try to you, if you do it in estimates of TFP, is similar. If you just uh, have rough measures of income, it will be fairly oh, similar. So this oh, this uh, non-narrowing uh, gap. For which period? Um, so the data that we have is from uh, '93 to 2002, but. I think this non uh, this non narrowing gap is is a feature that you see today as well. But you see, the key thing about agriculture is that it really took off um, between 1978 to 1990. Yes. So the first 44 Chinese economic growth. Yes. Solely due to agriculture. Yeah, yeah. So now that was very special. About yeah, land. that was that was very special because what that they went from. So China, uh, when in that period of initial reforms, they went from 
from having really collectivization where everything was done as a collective unit to, to a household-based model of agriculture. And that generated, generated a, big, a big impact in terms of, a, especially when people account, most of the impact on productivity was on farmers' <coughs> effort. So the collectivization really dampened the effort that farmers make in, in generating output. So this, this generated a big boost in productivity. But basically that, by 1984, that died. That all those effort, the channel kind of died. And then since then, this gap has been basically not shrinking, right? And so that suggests of a gap. In any, in any, other, uh, you know, any other experience of structural change that you see, um, the productivity growth in agriculture is much larger than in non-agriculture. So you see this convergence in incomes. Yeah. That was my question. Yeah. So, so, so in that sense, because I mean, you may say, you know, China is growing, so you know, how could there be so, such a big problem? But this underlines a, a, a problem of growth. Yeah. That statement holds true across all agricultural products, or there might be something like uh, products that have to be sold more locally, uh, where there might be a difference in demand elasticity because infrastructure like roads is, is different. Yeah, I don't know. There, there may be something to that, but I, I'm going to emphasize something else. So maybe we'll we'll get back to, to this. I mean, my my point is basically going to be at a basic level is just land is severely misallocated. Um, so um, you know, in China, the the, the operational scale, uh, so basically, kind of the, the size of the farms uh, as they operate is, is very small. Compared to the U.S., obviously, the U.S. is a much larger, you know, big endowed country. But even if you compare to developed countries that have kind of similar line endowment, you know, this is a tiny, tiny kind of operational scales. Um, you know, it's an economy that has uh, a not well-defined property rights over land. So households are allocated these use rights. And these use rights are allocated in a fairly egalitarian way kind of uniformly across, across households. And then there's really no rental markets where kind of use rights could be, could be reallocated. Because effectively what it operates is this use it or lose it um, idea. And so people really fear uh, leaving the land. And typically when you see some rental markets, people have emphasized that rental markets have, have actually started to develop in China. But what happens is that the individuals are really, that these rental markets are not really allowing the, the, fa the land to go to the more e efficient uses. Instead, most of these rental markets are really close relatives of family members because you, you fear this reallocation uh, effect. But more importantly, we have, we have, we have a good data uh, where, where, where kind of an analysis can be made. And this data is, is panel. So we are going to be able to exploit some of this panel dimension <coughs> in um, in our analysis, okay. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, use this data from, from China and then a quantitative framework to first, uh, I'm gonna show you um, some pictures that are gonna uh, motivate the extent of misallocation in agriculture. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask whether you see that across villages or whether things change over time. Um, and then I'm going to show you how important that misallocation is in the, in the sense of how, you know, some, some benchmark of uh, if, if factors were allocated better, how much uh, productivity or output uh, could go up in this economy in a static sense. And then I'm going to use that analysis to basically come up with a summary measure of, of misallocation, which then I'm going to use in my second part of, of the talk. So the second part is just going to embed that kind of that simple a industry uh, uh, version of the agricultural sector into a two-sector uh, gene equilibrium model where now individuals are going to optimally decide where to locate. And so I'm going to uh, use this, this model to estimate kind of the, the key moments. Uh, one of the key moments is going to be this correlation of income across switchers that we see in the panel to kind of pin down a relevant correlation of abilities across sectors. And then I'm going to, I'm going to assess the extent to which this, this institutional aspects that generate misallocation in the first place, whether they are also distorting this channel of, of selection and how it impacts agricultural TFP. Yeah. And, and could you say a little bit about the motivating factor, which is that there's a draw in the economy and there's a gap. So is it going to be about levels or about growth rates? It's going to be about levels, yeah. And so... I to think about this, like, around 20. Well, I mean, um, 
certainly, so that, that's why I wanted to make that distinction that in growth, uh, China has been growing. And in fact, what you see is that uh, both agricultural productivity and non-agricultural productivity grow and basically at, at the same rate. There's a lot of debate about whether that rate is high or low in terms of the measurement. But what you see is that then the gap between the two is, is not growing. So, so my analysis is really going to be about the level, about the level of this gap that agricultural productivity is, is going to be low relative to non-agriculture. Because I mean, uh, China has also you know has done a lot of things that are that are that are generating growth in kind of economy-wide TFP that is also affecting agriculture. I understand that, but when you do the, the so my, what I learned was when you look at agricultural changes, there is a period when regions converge. The way I don't want to learn, so it might still be that the TFP of agriculture related, related, relative to the rest of the economy is higher in China than in other. So, <coughs> the, 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 the data I would like to see to motivate it is that when I look at the relative productivity, it's way lower than in other yeah, and places. Yeah, and it is. So, basically, that ratio is a factor of three. So, non agricultural productivity is about a factor of three to, to, to agriculture. When it depends who you want to compare it, but it would be. Uh, you know, developed countries will be 1.5, will be half of that. Yeah. But in other, so other countries that have that sort of growth experience, that, that don't have these institutions you claim, it would also be smaller to get. Like say, I don't know, say Vietnam, or I don't know what's a country that grew fast recently, and didn't have those land institutions, your theory would apply that the gap is smaller. Right? And that, you have data on that, or is it? Yeah, I mean, I, well, so. The, 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 rate, the data on the gap, but the, the, the problem is that that also depends on other things. So if you have a, a labor market a, a, a mobility barriers, right, that differ across countries, then that, that could clear out that picture. But in general, when you look at this gap and you, you plot it against GDP per capita, it's systematic. So this gap is a lot higher for countries that are poor relative to rich. And then there will be kind of some variation along, along the line. So it's not unique to these land market institutions. There are many things that could drive this low productivity in agriculture. But um, the interesting aspect of, of, of the Chinese case is that you know, this, land, this uh, land market institution is, is very extreme. That you know, there's essentially no land markets and these use rights are, are distributed in a particular way. And so that's going to really um, be important I mean, you will see when I do this, this first part, I mean, one of the big issues of doing cal cal calculating wedges in, in, in assessing misallocation is that really we don't know what's behind that, okay? And so our attempt is to try to connect this misallocation with, an inst with a policy or institution. In the case of China, it's very clear. So when you look at kind of the, the cross-country exercise, then you could have a little bit of that, a little bit of other, other frictions. 0.7 hectares, that's already well above the subsistence level, right? Probably, that's like a, that's like a small farm. Yeah. That's probably, but it's probably bigger than like yeah, in so, Africa, right? Yeah. We have like the village and everybody's working a very small farm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, um, I have the distribution. Obviously, this is very, you know, 90, I think 90, uh, close to 80% of the farmers are even below like a quarter hectare. So um, if you compare it to countries in Africa, uh, the extent of subsistence farming may not be as high as there. And obviously China is not as poor as those countries. Um, but in terms of the pattern of kind of factor allocation, it's going to be uh, quite striking. So I'll show you the pictures in that. Diego, a very quick question. So usually, like in a country like China, where there was this huge wave of urbanization, uh, you would expect the most productive farmers to stay behind. And when people leave, he buys all the land, right? Yeah. And product, so yeah. Border, so it's interesting, yeah. And so, but even, it, even after they move to the household base system, you could. Okay. Say so that again. So I lost that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But even today, they cannot buy the land. No. What happens with the land which is left behind? That's the question. What happens with the land which people, is left behind? People, well, <laughs> you pointed to something which is very interesting in these institutions. People never leave the land behind. 
but in the some ones sense. Who to the city, so there is, there is somebody <laughs> well, the, the, a lot of the migration is that. So they leave the, the older, the older individual state. When you see full houses, then that's when the, because the, this is all at the village level, there's some relocation. But just to point out, so average farm size have actually declined in the period that we have in mind. While in any other growing economy, the average farm size should go up for, for what you're saying. But moreover, uh, there is a lot of anecdotal evidence that the, um, and it's suggestive of, of the data that we have, that the, 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 the farmers that are living are the high productivity farmers, not low, low productivity farmers. And this is going to speak to the type of distortions I'm going to emphasize. So it's correlated yes. Yeah. Well, think about it this way, sorry, just because, think about it this way. You have, a, you have an institution that basically alloc allocates land fairly uniformly, right? Now, if you think the efficient land distribution should be really co positively correlated to, to the productivity of the farmer, right? And so implicitly, this institution generates a wedge that is kind of penalizing more the, the, the more productivity farmers. So that's going to be key for the analysis. Buy, is there any selection going on, or again, you want to say buy when they... Yeah, the, the, my, buy, I mean government yeah when they cover, it's, it's all government owned, so, so, yeah, but when they take to, I don't know if we can analyze it with, with this data, but my co-author claims that it's not, it's not selective, um, that it's really, I mean, it's, it's related to, 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 to the closest, to, to, to the distance to the city, but, but it's, it's not systematic in the sense of the quality of land for, for agriculture, etc. Okay, um, most likely I won't have time, so let me just tell you uh, uh, the, 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 the things we find. So, not surprisingly, we're going to find a lot of misallocation of, of land and capital across farmers, uh, even within villages. Um, and then the output gains that we're getting from eliminating misallocation is about 84%. So, Ag aggregate agricultural output and TFP will go up by 84% if we were to reallocate factors to, to the, their, their efficient levels. I mean, it's not a huge number relative to other, uh, other contexts, but you'll see that um, in the end, part of this is related to the fact that the distribution of farmers' productivity is actually quite, uh, um, it's not very dispersed compared to other contexts. And so that's why this number is not uh, super high. So with Raul, for example, we have done so a sim. Really yeah, it's high. <laughs> well, I guess um, in, in in my mind, uh, I have a paper with with Raul looking at Malawi, and in Malawi, uh, this number will be 3.6 times. Yeah, it's a big number. Um, so the, these distortions are systematically positively correlated with farm productivity. Um, and then in the two sectors, we're going to find that these abilities in, in our estimates are going to be positively correlated. Not huge, but they are going to be positively correlated. And this is going to be important because it really determines who are the farmers that are, that, that are living agriculture. Okay? It's going to imply this together with the fact that the distortions also shrink the effective dispersions of income in agriculture related to non-agriculture is going to mean that the, the selection is going to work that uh, the, the, the more productive individuals work in non-agriculture. And so when we do a, co a quantifactor of eliminating this systematic component of the distortions, when we eliminate the, the correlation of, of the distortions with farming ability, uh, agricultural productivity is going to increase in, in the model by 74%. And a lot, of it, um, a lot of it has to do with improved selection, the selection channel. If it, the static gains in this exercise will be 24% increase. The rest is just the selection effect. Okay? So hopefully I can... So usually the people who leave the farm are the new generation. So, you know, the older one leave behind. So is that... No, no. So we are going to look at, um, I mean, this is, this is a tricky part of how, how you look at. Ideally, you, you would like to think about individuals, but, you know, the, 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 the farming activities is best described as a family farm, right? And so we're going to really work with the household level 
um, observations. And so when uh, in the data, I'm only going to consider relocations that involve the entire household moving. Okay. Yes. And so this is going to be, in terms of total relocation, much less than individual level relocations. Okay. But the problem with the individual level is then um, a, a, you really have much more difficult track I mean, you can measure their wages in non-agriculture, but in, in, the, in the farming, it becomes tricky, okay? So, so think about it as household level observations, okay? Um, can I ask something more about the literature? So, so, I mean, you have these, I think obviously these models, right? So you have, assuming some production function, right? You have the prediction from your model that if I allocate, for example, land, I give that plot to somebody else and he produces twice as much, right? So these huge gains on the table, and usually we can't observe that counterfactual, right? Yeah. Whereas in developing countries, I mean, we have these randomized controlled trials that probably often try to address these issues, right? So are some numbers that you get from randomized controlled trials on that order of magnitude? Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know. I should look into that. Um, I should look into that. Um, But if anything, I would expect that, um, so, so typically you, you think about um, kind of measuring the productivity of, uh, at the production unit, in this case, the kind of the farm, and, and then factor allocations. So in the, in the model, you make some as, some as if you kind of statically could reallocate factors, keeping constant that, that distribution of productivities. I would expect that if I, if I allow the more productive farmers to have more land and then kind of you know, take advantage of their uh, higher abilities or productivities, that in fact that the gains will be even larger than what I would get with just the static effect. Because I mean, there's a lot of dynamic aspects that are involved in productivity, you know, incentives, that are being uh, hammered by the fact that, that you can grow. And in some way, if you look at, um, so no, um, I don't think there's any study that looks at it for, for agriculture, but for, um, uh, for, for the ma uh, manufacturing sector, we know from this analysis of, of CA and Clino, when they look at the life cycle of plants, that in fact you see over time plants getting better in the U.S., but when you look at economies like China and India, uh, you know, uh, Mexico and India, that their life cycle profile of productivity is kind of flat. And I think, so I would expect that if I can really do this, this, uh, this experiments, I will see that not only there will be an ef a positive effect on, on aggregate productivity just by relocating, but that you will see a boost on productivity at the individual level as well. That's interesting, I'll look into that. So uh, let me tell you the framework. Um, 18 minutes. Okay, 18 minutes. <laughs> oh, okay. <coughs> <laughs> That's the 18 minutes is the threshold. <laughs> okay. So the, the, actually for, for doing this part, I should be able to do it very simply. You, um, I guess you, you understand that um, the exercise is to kind of look at the people who are in agriculture, try to measure their productivity and see how factors are allocated, you know, how the factors are allocated in that context. And so here there's some details in terms of how we, how we look at that. So we could look at that at, at the village level or province level and then individual level. So there's some notation for that, but you know, it's not critical for what you, uh, for in the end, what you, what you get. What's important that you understand what the, you know, for, for thinking about misallocation and this kind of, um, whether factors are, are kind of out of whack, you need a benchmark. So let me tell you what the benchmark is. So a farm, it's basically, it's going to be this production unit that has this input of the farm operator, and this is the family farm, okay? It's going to be some underlying productivity of that um, farm. And then it's going to have the inputs of land and capital, which are the most important inputs. And so there's decreasing returns to scale at the production unit, and, the, and this is critical. So the assumption here is that they produce uh, kind of the same good, but it's kind of a span of control over these, um, these, these input factors. And so this is relevant because um, you want you, like an efficient allocation here is not going to be one that gives all the land to the more productive farmer. Okay, that you would, given, given a set of farmers, you would always allocate land 
uh, uh, to all of them, but the proportion is just going to be changing based on the productivity. So you would like, the efficient allocation would be such that you allocate more land to the more or, uh, capital to the more productive farmers. And in fact, if two farmers have the same productivity, you know their optimal size should be the same. So now you put everything into managerial spirit, but I, I don't know China, but at least in my country, that it, even within the village, there are huge differences in the quality of land, and that's kind of another dimension of misallocation. <laughs> that who gets the good land and who gets the bad land. Yeah. Um, and now but you put, in, in your measurement, everything is going to manage your ability, which is maybe just the quality of the land difference. That's yeah, no, that's very important, because if it's quality of the land, then the my reallocation exercise is not, uh, is not valid, because it's, it's not the manager that matters, it's the quality of land. So the, there are several things. So first of all, the, the most of the games that we're going to find are at the village level, where where the kind of the dispersion of quality of land should be much less, right? That's one constraint. Uh, unfortunately, in this data, this data has lots of good things, but one of the things it doesn't have is good measures of land quality. In, in my analysis uh, with, with Raul for Malawi, where you have very good uh, uh, quality measures, um, what we find is that the variation, so obviously the land quality it matters, and there's variation in that, but that um, the variation of, of, of that, at least in the case of Malawi, was tiny compared to kind of the variations in output. Um, so for sure, I mean, there's not a, an explicit correction I can do of the data, but to the extent that I see that, and we did this with Raul as well, that, I mean, if you think that you, even if you have the measure that you're not correcting very well for land quality, when you think about reallocations um, in, in, in a kind of narrower geographical sense, um, uh, you still get a lot of action there. Okay. So that's important because this is, going, you know, I'm always going to relate kind of the land distribution with some idea of a benchmark where kind of factors should be related to the productivity of the, of the farmer. So within village, everybody produces more or less the same portfolio of products? I mean, it's not that one produces rice and the other produces <coughs> milk? Yeah. No, basically, there's a lot of, I mean, there's variation across regions, but within a village, it's fairly, Everybody produces yeah, the same yeah, variety. yeah, and I think that's common throughout. And there are no joint farms, two, two, two families joining land and working together? So if they do that, that's one farm for me. So, yeah, so this is very important, and, and the same applies, so every time I talk about, because in this type of framework, what matters is the operational scale. Right, who owns the factors and what, yeah, okay. So, <clears throat> now, you, you know, you can calculate, where I have no time to do that, so the, <laughs> um, so I'm gonna show you tre three levels of, I mean, you don't actually need to compute the wages to find out how important this is, uh, the extent of misallocation are. You basically can, you using that production fu function, you can uh, calculate what, what's the aggregate output in that economy, holding the total amount of capital, the total amount of land, holding the distribution of farmers that you see in that village, how much output will go up if, you, if factors are allocated to their efficient use, and compare that to the actual. And then you can do that across village, and you can do that nationwide. Okay, I'm going to show you those three different levels. So the data comes from this survey. It uh, has been used in a lot of studies of the Chinese economy. Um, it has 10 provinces from 93 to 2002. In principle, we can, we can go farther out, but um, this is, you know, we had easy access to this part. It's on balance panel with about 1,000 households uh, from 110 villages. And there is, so basically, it's almost like 80 households per village. There is, we have detailed information on the income by sector, and then for agriculture, we have the detailed information on the output, the inputs, prices, so that we can actually do kind of value-added calculation and product, you know, TFP cal capital, too? capital, but in agriculture, intermediate inputs, uh, you know, fertilizer. You have like a tractor or yes, yes, yeah, very detailed information about the different types of capital, yeah. You know, not surprising, you know, when, when you go to the household level, 
And in agriculture, most, most of these farmers, uh, or many of these farmers, you know, maybe they don't even take their products to the market. So a lot of the data collection is about to figure out exactly, you know, their income is not going to be some, some sales, some record of sales. It's really going to be about how much they produce. And so, so they are very good at getting in, inputs and outputs. I'm. What? Yeah, I, I, do, do you know, uh, Rachel? Like, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, when is that like, like in the reflection for activity? I think, I think it's very much um, by the market nowadays. Yeah. yeah. So, so being, you know, being changed from one to the other. So that's going to be relevant when I look at non agriculture. So Obviously, in agriculture, it's. I mean, in a way, China is a, it has become a very market economy. Yeah, yeah. And the, the one place that is lagging behind, and I'm going to talk, well, if I have time, I'll talk about this, um, it, that is lagging behind is really this, uh, this, this land market. Okay? There are some provinces that are trying to implement rental markets. So they don't want to go all the way to give private property, but they're trying to set up a rental market for the use rights that people feel secure that they're not going to lose their uh, kind of their entitlements. Okay, so. Yes, in some, in, yeah, I'll show you that. <clears throat> okay, so then uh, the, the first part is kind of measuring this at the farm level, so there's some assumption about the, the inputs. Basically, we took the, the factor shares that seem reasonable, or at least Lauren tells me that this is a reason for China. If you were to take the U.S. factor shares, then we'll get even larger numbers. So we went from what Lauren thought it was reasonable for China. So, so you only consider the effects of this allocation within agriculture, right? You don't consider what happens when labor moves to non Right. I, I, I'm going to talk about that later. But yes, so here I'm emphasizing a kind of misallocation in, in thank you, misallocation in agriculture. Um, these distortions. Obviously, m misallocation could be prevalent everywhere, okay? But this institution is something that affects all allocation of, of land in particular, and because it's all, you, you cannot use this land to get credit, then this distortion really acts a, as an output tax. So uh, we think of this as being kind of special within the agricultural sector because it's an institution that relates to land that's important in, in agriculture. Um, and so everything else is going to be subsumed, like if there's mis you know, credit market frictions, that, that should affect the entire economy, but I'm going to subsume that in some sort of economy-wide TFP. Okay? So this is the distribution of productivity in China. There's nothing strange other than just to give you a bit of context that if you look at the dispersion, so this log normal, 90 to 10 ratio is sixfold in China, it's 75 to 25 percentile ratio is 2.44. Now, actually, this dispersion is relatively small compared to other contexts. If you take Cian Clino manufacturing plants in China or India, the 90 to 10 ratio will be something like 13 or 14. Okay, so there's nothing about this measurement. There's nothing crazy in terms of the dispersion of productivity that, that we're getting. And so this is the allocation of land and capital that we see, and this is for the year 2000. Looks very similar throughout the, all the years. So what you see, the, 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 what you see is this is uh, log TFP and this is log land input. The efficient allocation will be a straight line here, positive slope, right? Uh, and what you see is that basically there's no systematic relationship between the land <coughs> people have and TFP. And in fact, we, given this institution I described, we, we shouldn't expect this to be related, right? The, these use rights are really given in a fairly egalitarian way. So T TFP is your S? Yes. And <coughs> well, the, the S to the something, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you use the panel dimension here in any way, or? No, for this S, no. Later on, I'll show you what the, well, uh, uh, in the paper, there are numbers that tells you, um, so we, we've done the misallocation year by year, but then we can now exploit the panel and figure out some sort of uh, permanent component of TFP of the farm and do the misallocation like that. Um, and then we will get very similar results. Obviously, the, the numbers go down a little bit. It's about 85% of, of the numbers we do for a given year. 
Um, so that's the extent to which we used the panel in the, in the first stage. Just to clarify for this uh, data, what's the fraction of employment share and output share of agriculture? Um, it's about 42% of employment share, yeah, of, of agriculture, yeah. yeah. So, so, so it obviously has gone down more, but by in 2002 it was still 42%. No, no, no. I mean the 10 profits data that you have. The what? Ten provinces, yes. So our total agricultural employment, total agricultural output, what does your data tell us? Um, it's pretty large. Okay. It's pretty large, and this is a national representative sample. So even though we just we don't have all the provinces, but but the the, the inclusion of them kind of catch, captures the entire nation. It's large. I don't remember the exact number, but you know more than seventy percent. Okay, and so these are the numbers uh, that, that you get across the different, so I have, what, five minutes? Or? Six. Okay, um, so this is what I was saying. So if you do nationwide reallocation of factors, in the static sense, uh, output and TFP, because I'm, I'm keeping the factors the same, so this increase in output is also an increase in TFP, it's 84%, it is 60% if you only do within and across village reallocation, and then um, across villages capital. If you only do within villages, 42%. So the majority of, of these gains is reallocation that occurs even within narrowly defined villages. Uh, and then, you know, you could also ask how much of the, right, so in here, this misallocation between, you know, ha having a, the more productive farmers not having as much land as the less productive farmers, but even within a particular productivity class, this misallocation, these guys have a lot more land, this has less land, okay? while in the efficient, they should all have the same size. Uh, when you decompose the, um, uh, these, these gains and you ask how much is across the household, the systematic component, then for example, this one, which is gonna to relate to my, my number later, is uh, 24%. So about 50% of the overall gains in reallocation come from reallocating uh, across farmers with different levels of productivity. Yeah, but I think this is where uh, Arpad's comment is important, right? I mean, it, suppose that it's all land quality. Yeah, so well, so, okay. Here, it's not all land quality. <laughs> That's the bottom line. That was my answer. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a nice... I, I, do, you, do you have direct measure of land quality? Not, for this, okay. not for this data set. Not for this data set, okay? But again, if you really wanted to, for example, you know, pick, and we've, we've done that with, uh, with Raul in Malawi as well, like if you really wanted to ask much more narrowly, even within a village where you, where you know that geographically they are, you know, their land quality are, is not that different, uh, you find that the gains are fairly similar to, to what you have here. Um, so land quality matters. Right? And I think if you were comparing one province to another province, uh, it would be important to control for that as well. But within kind of this narrowly uh, uh, village I level. Mean the quality of the soil necessarily. I, we also have you know, farms back home. Yeah. It might be on a slope, right? So yeah. It's hard to get. Right, right. So in, uh, in, uh, th that is interesting because uh, now we have very good measures to kind of uh, uh, to, to, to get at the land quality that involves. Uh, so in the, in the data with Raul, there's basically 11 dimensions of, of land quality that has elevation, slope, uh, kind of so, you know, moisture retention, everything. And um, so what you find is that, of course, it, 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 it matters. So if you have a better quality land, you will produce more output. But in the context of these calculations of misallocation, there was nothing kind of systematic across. Um. So the bottom line is that this, this my, my take of the evidence, even though I cannot do it for this, <clears throat> for this data specifically, is that the land quality is not an issue, that these differences reflect um, you know, farmers. So uh, this is the most important part of the paper. <laughs> and I have what, zero or? Oh. Three minutes. And so, <laughs> um, so now I'm going to embed this into a two-sector model. So it's going to be very standard, ROI, okay? But what is different, so people are going to have ability in agriculture. And that's going to map to my measures of productivity. They're going to have ability in non-agriculture. 
And the key is that there's going to be these distortions that affect the operation of the farms, okay? And so I'm going to use a measure that kind of captures the, the overall distortion in agriculture, which include capital, land, and these uh, village distortions. But I'm just going to model it as one. So you can calculate incomes in agriculture, incomes in non-agriculture. You know, you specify we're going to have like nor no log normal distribution so we can uh, characterize this model uh, easier. So there's going to be some correlation of abilities across sectors. It can be negative. We're going to estimate that from the data. Then on the kind of preference side, it's going to be fairly standard. It's a, a kind of subsistence constraint of agriculture. So this is going to work like a typical two-sector growth model, except that inside, so if you're unproductive in agriculture, you're going to allocate more factors in agriculture, so to produce this, this minimum uh, consumption of agriculture. But how is productivity in agriculture is really going to be determined by all the heterogeneity and all the selection aspects that, I, that I'm embedding here. And so um, the income in agriculture, what's important is that you can divide into kind of uh, components that are common across these uh, farmers. And then there's a um, kind of a component that relates to the distortions that are in, you know, idiosyncratic, faced by the individual, and then the ability. And then what's going to happen is that basically you can characterize decisions based on the effective ability. Okay? And given the pattern I show you about these distortions, what this does is really compress the dispersion of, of, of abilities in the agricultural sector because these distortions are such that kind of hit harder, or these wedges are such that it hits harder, the more productive farmers. Okay, so the, the, from the data, we, we're going to have this correlation of abilities and distortions. Um, and occupational choice is just kind of the optimal thing. You, you're going to go where the income is higher. So the, um, just so that you see what are, the, what are the factors, I guess this was your question at the beginning, is that obviously um, there's going to be some ratio that depending on where you are. So the people who have productivity that is, that is higher in agriculture relative to non-agriculture, they're going to go to agriculture and so on. Now, where you're going to be depends on the distribution of, of, of abilities in the economy. So just for illustration, here's a situation where the correlation of abilities is positive, um, but uh, the dispersion of productivity in non-agriculture is larger than in agriculture. Okay? And as I said, distortions would actually make this uh, more of the case. What you see is that if that's the pattern that you see in the data, then you're going to have that the um, more productive workers are going to be in agriculture and the less productive workers are going to be in non-agriculture. Okay, so that's, that's going to be relevant. So it's a calibration and the idea is, you know, we're going to exploit this panel dimension. We, got, we have data on switchers from, agri from agriculture to non-agriculture that, that we can use. And so we use it um, and we find that um, that this correlation is positive, what I told you before is about 35%, and that in fact the dispersion in abilities in non-agriculture are larger than in agriculture, and moreover the effective abilities in, 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 in agriculture are much less dispersed. <clears throat> So in general, they are uh, more educated. Um, and in general, they have maybe less use rights. So, so they were operating smaller farms. OK. I don't remember what the average is. Uh, um, yeah, I think I, I could. Yeah, they have less school. Less school, yeah. Yes. So um, to. So the counterfactual that, that we do in the paper first, I mean, this, this part is still very preliminary. We, we should do a lot more things. But is to basically eliminate this systematic component of the distortions, just collapse the correlation of abilities. And, and um, so this, this should correspond to a situation that if you eliminate only that component in the static calculation of productivity, productivity was going to go up by 24%. Okay. In the model, it goes up by 74%. Okay. And the reason is that now this systematic component allows more productive farmers to stay in agriculture. You can almost see it from the picture that I showed you before. Okay. But I want to contrast that, and I end with this. Uh, I want to contrast that with the situation of 
just filling in a 24% increase in productivity in this model, either in the agricultural sector or in the non-agricultural <coughs> sector. Okay? Because both of those situations will generate some selection pattern. Um, in this case, the selection will be driven by mostly like gener generic equilibrium effects. It's going to change the relative price of agriculture and it's going to tilt the incomes in the two sectors. Okay? But when I do that, Notice the amplification effect of selection when it's just something that affects the entire economy or just everybody in agriculture is tiny, 24% to 26%. Okay. So, uh, so this is very different. You know, this, this selection as an amplification is very different if it's generated by something that affects everybody in, in the sector or everybody in the economy financial frictions, all the type of distortion, versus distortions that are specific that really affect the return of the, of the productive workers in agriculture. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Sorry I went over time.